Uh, well, good morning. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Can everybody at the back hear me all right? Okay. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And uh, Auntie Violet, thank you very much for that welcome to country. It's great to see you again. And uh, we also acknowledge the great contribution uh, of the Ngunnawal people to the culture and uh, community here in Canberra. So thank you very much. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Admiral Paul Madison. Thank you very much for those uh, very generous words, Paul. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, the Royal Australian Air Force historian, Alan Stevens. Alan and I did pilot training um, a long time ago, uh, but we've known each other for many, many years. And I would commend Alan's book on the history of the Royal Australian Air Force to all of you. Sir James Rowland was rated as an above average pilot who flew 34 missions in World War I with Bomber Command, latterly as a pathfinder. He escaped his stricken Lancaster after a mid-air collision over Germany and finished his career, as Paul said, as Chief of the Air Staff in 1979. After leaving, he said, to serve in the Royal Australian Air Force and finally to lead it were the greatest privileges of my life that my life had brought and I'm humbly grateful to all those with whom I have served. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones to serve under him, as was Alan. He was a wonderful man. But my purpose this morning is to trace the, uh, the long journey from our pioneering and wartime experiences early in the 20th century uh, to an Air Force operational culture that we have today of mission first and safety always. I'll now move to the second slide. Hope it, there we go. All Australians need to know more about the wonderful achievement of Australian Flying Corps pilot Ross Smith, his brother and Royal Air Force pilot Keith Smith, and uh, Australian Flying Corps flight engineers Wally Shears and Jim Bennett in conducting the first flight from London to Darwin in 1919. This year, a hundred years after their historic flight, we will commemorate and celebrate that success in November. This year, a hundred years after the historic flight, sorry, um, a century after the epic flight to win the uh, air race from Great Britain to Australia, it's difficult to comprehend what a great achievement it was. The other four official contestants in the air race crashed out, two of them in fatal accidents. In this modern era, era, we can board a 787 Dreamliner in London and fly non-stop and in complete comfort and safety to Perth in all weathers in about 17 hours. It has become routine. In contrast, Ross and his crew flew their Vickers Vimy from London to Darwin for 18,000 kilometres in 136 hours of flying over 24 sectors in 28 days, often landing and taking off from unsuitable and dangerous airfields, horse racing tracks, jungle clearings and desert strips. The challenge was immense. The risk was extreme. The Vimy, as you can see from the slide, was a twin-engine biplane with an open cockpit with no protection from the elements for the crew. With the rudimentary navigation instruments, very basic flight instruments, and no autopilot, artificial horizon, or anti-icing equipment, only an experienced, skilled, and determined pilot and crew could have handled the challenge and managed the risks of this pioneering flight. 
Ross Smith was a remarkable man who joined the Third Light Horse at the outbreak of war in 1914. He was an Anzac and fought at Gallipoli for most of the campaign, and in the Middle East at the Battle of Romani. After joining No. 1 Squadron Australian Flying Corps, he demonstrated great courage and skill in the air, shooting down 11 enemy aircraft in the Middle East. His bravery and inspirational wartime service on the ground and in the air was recognised with the award of a military cross and bar and a distinguished flying cross and two bars. On occasion, he was Lawrence of Arabia's personal pilot. In his book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, Lawrence uh, describes an incident in the desert involving Ross Smith. And I quote, it was breakfast time with a smell of sausage in the air. We sat round, very ready, but the watcher on the broken tower yelled, aeroplane up, seeing one coming over from Dara. Our Australians scrambling wildly to their yet hot machines started them in a moment. Ross Smith with his observer leaped into one and climbed like a cat up the sky. He was an Australian of a race delighting in additional risks. There were one enemy two-seater and three scouts. Ross Smith fastened on to the big one and after five minutes of sharp machine gun rattle, the German dived suddenly towards the railway line. As it flashed behind the low ridge, there broke out a pennon of smoke and from its falling place, a soft dark cloud. Five minutes later, Ross Smith was back and jumped gaily out of his machine, swearing that the Arab front was the place. Our sausages were still hot. We ate them and drank tea. Ross Smith's mission on the epic flight to Australia was to fly a machine lacking equipment and airworthiness through primitive and makeshift landing areas. Mitigating risk to ensure a completely safe operation by our current standards was impossible. The first military flight in Australia occurred on the 1st of March 1914. The first accident occurred the same day with a dog running into a propeller. The first pilot's course commenced in August of 1914, two weeks after the outbreak of the war. Number one squadron, Australian Flying Corps, arrived in Egypt in April 1916, a bare, a bare two years after the first flight. From tentative beginnings, with a lack of trained and experienced people, the squadron gradually gained an operational capability, recruiting and training many experienced soldiers. Light horse soldiers proved to be excellent observers. Many, like Ross Smith, went on to become pilots. By mid-1917, as experience was gained and new, more capable aircraft were provided, the squadron was excelling in its roles of reconnaissance, photography, bombing and control of the air, three of the four core air power roles. Of particular note was Number 1 Squadron's involvement in all General Allenby's major offensives, including the gaza Bathsheba line, Bathsheba, and the capture of Damascus. The British Air Commander considered Number 1 Squadron to be his best squadron, and General Allenby addressed the squadron on parade after the armistice with the following words. You gain for us absolute supremacy of the air, thereby enabling my cavalry, artillery and infantry to carry out their work on the ground, practically unmolested by hostile aircraft. RAF historian Alan Stevens here today comments that Allenby's praise serves as testimony 
to the remarkable achievements of a small group of men who tri triumphed in an entirely new field of combat and who, in doing so, laid the foundations of Australian air power. These men, led principally by the remarkable Richard Williams, shared a culture which I would describe as mission first to deliver the required results at any cost. Safety was not a consideration and high levels of risk were a constant companion on all operations. Even at this early stage, it is clear that Allenby, Williams and the experienced airmen in No. 1 Squadron understood and appreciated that air supremacy was crucial to operational success on the ground. These days, we do not, and I repeat, do not seek out additional risk. Rather, in the Royal Australian Air Force and the Australian Defence Force of the 21st century, management of risk as an imperative in all training and operational flying activities. We seek to mitigate risk wherever possible to ensure the safety of aircrew and passengers in both training areas and conflict areas of operation. Sorry, what happened there? With the outbreak of war in 1939, the Royal Australian Air Force was under-resourced and ill-prepared for war. With only 3,500 people and 246 obsolescent aircraft. In early 1940, the, aircraft, the Air Force had only 16 flying instructors. To meet the requirements of the Empire Air Training Schemes, the Air Force had to increase its pilot training rate from 50 graduates a year, uh, which was the, uh, to a target of over 10,000 a year. The rapid training build-up, instructor inexperience, and aircraft with many vices provided a high risk and dangerous flying training environment. Many aircrew were killed in training, and more aircraft were lost in training in Australia than to enemy action in the southwest Pacific. An Armadale resident I talked to a few weeks ago told me that one local family lost all three sons in flying training accidents in Australia. Accident rates at operational training units were higher than the basic flight training schools particularly in units where pilots had to convert to single-seat, high-performance aircraft like the Kitty Hawk, without dual instruction or instruction in a simulator. I was shocked when I visited the Air Force Association Mu Museum at Mildura in 2011. I learned that number two operational training unit, the one represented on the slide, the Kitty Hawk conversion unit, experienced 45 fatal accidents during the war. Many of the 52 who died lie at rest in the Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery in Mildura as a poignant reminder of the great cost of flying training in World War II. The overriding imperative for the Air Force leadership in World War II was to churn out as many aircrew as possible to meet the demand in frontline operational squadrons in the European and later the Southwest Pacific theatres. Airworthiness of aircraft and the safety of aircrew were not high priorities. The war had to be won and the human costs and the very high and extreme risks associated with flying training and operations were considered acceptable by the Australian government and the Air Force leadership of the time. In England, the Australians who flew with Bomber Command comprised only 2% of those who enlisted in World War II, yet they sustained an, outst an astounding 20% of Australian combat deaths. Each mission over Europe was extreme risk. 3,486 3, were killed in action. 
These brave men contributed significantly to the final victory in Europe. We should be grateful for their devotion to duty and their service and sacrifice. After World War II, defence aviation continued to lose people and aircraft in aircraft accidents. This slide shows clearly the gradual improvement, decade by decade, as aircraft technology improved. Engines became more reliable and safety programs began to take effect. However, in my view, we still had a cultural problem. When I joined the Royal Australian Air Force in 1970, all the senior commanders had World War II experience or Korean War experience. Accordingly, there was a general acceptance that aircraft accidents were part and parcel of military, military flying. While technical airworthiness was improving in leaps and bounds, operational airworthiness was lagging, and in some units, a cavalier approach to operational flying was encouraged and or accepted. On occasion, I observed a can-do culture which encouraged flying on or exploring the absolute limits when there was no need to do so. There was no safety margin for mum and the kids. Let me now talk about leadership, culture and safety by telling two stories about, firstly, occupational health and safety, and secondly, flying safety. In my first week as Chief of Air Force, I had a visit from the President of the Board of Inquiry into the reseal deseal maintenance process on the F-111 aircraft fuel tanks. The President of the Board opened with a statement that shocked me. He said, I've only been in the job three days at this stage. Air Marshal, you have a problem. Air Force has a culture which puts platforms before people. He then described how operational and maintenance priorities had been pursued without proper consideration of the occupational health and safety of the maintenance workforce. The fuel tank workers had been exposed to substances in the fuel tanks and over the months and years, they had become sick. The maintenance supervisors and the base medical staff failed to understand the relationship between the adverse working environment and their health conditions. Some of the sick workers were treated as malingerers. This was a failure of leadership over a long period of time, particularly in terms of occupational health. And clearly, there was a need uh, to change uh, this culture. So people first, people before platforms became my mantra and the mantra of the senior leadership team that supported me so well at that time. We already had a leadership and behavioural compact developed under my predecessor, Air Marshal Errol McCormick. And this, with adaption to the new people first culture, provided a good st starting point for changing our culture. I travelled the country and spoke to small groups, large groups, courses and commanders. People first became an important criterion for promotion and command selection. One of the keys to success in changing the culture was to win the full and enthusiastic support of middle management in the form of the Air Force senior non-commissioned officers. We brought them all together at Amberley in Queensland for a leadership and culture summit. After two days, we achieved consensus on the way ahead and they all individually signed a leadership and cultural compact that they had developed reflecting the required values and behaviours. The act of signing enhanced individual commitment to the culture, its values and the required behaviours. We also changed our people strategy to better balance Air Force requirements against individual requirements. We continued strong, for, strong support for those adversely affected by the reseal, deseal maintenance process 
I would meet with them and their families every few months. So after four years as Chief of Air Force, how did it go? In her book, Living Strategy, Professor Linda Gatton emphasises that people are at the heart of corporate purpose. Using her exemplar or high performance employer benchmarks of pride of 90%, trust at 80% and commitment at 80%, results for Air Force over four years were as follows. Pride went up from 75% to 85%. Trust at 75% increased to 82%. Commitment at 92% increased to 96%. Additionally, separation rates were down to below 5%, which compared very favourably with Army and Navy, which were running at much higher levels. There were no recruitment shortages in any areas. Indeed, with very few vacancies, we were oversubscribed. Simply put, Air Force people loved a people first culture. Let me now say a few words about establishing and maintaining the right flying safety culture, managing risk and establishing airworthiness uh, systems. From 1980 to 1991, the ADF lost 64 aircraft and 45 people in peacetime training accidents. To put this in context, we lost 42 people in Afghanistan on the battlefield over a long period of time. 45 people in peacetime training accidents, 42 people on the battlefield. So clearly, the peacetime fatal accident rate was totally unacceptable. Compare this to Air Force's current fatal accident rate in the air. On the 18th of April 2019, Air Force passed the significant and great achievement of no fatal accidents in 20 years, a zero fatal accident rate sustained for 20 years. How was this achieved? In my view, leadership and culture were the key. Shortly after becoming Chief of Air Force in late 1994, Air Marshal Les Fisher gathered the senior operational people in the Air Force to Canberra for a conference to provide his direction to improve flying safety in the Air Force. As I recall it, he delivered a strong statement that flying safety in the Air Force must be enhanced. He said he would accept nothing less than a zero fatal accident rate. He would take disciplinary action against anyone involved in unauthorised, dangerous or cavalier flying. He also informed us that a comprehensive flying safety audit would be conducted by an independent senior officer from the British Royal Air Force during 1995. From that period, our flying culture changed progressively and over time became characterised by professionalism, risk assessment and safety management. The change in culture was supported by a more robust regulatory uh, foundation, a highly effective operational and tech work, technical airworthiness management and assurance system introduced by Air Marshal Fennell in 1991 and an enhanced safety management system. Since 1999, despite having to operate in a multitude of challenging environments like Afghanistan, Iraq and the Pacific on disaster relief and humanitarian operations, Air Force has excelled with great results and no airmen or airwomen have been lost in accidents. Since 1999, uh, Air Force has operated in a, a multi multitude of operations involving all force element groups, 
in the early 2000s, we introduced pre-deployment battle worthiness boards to review the operating environment, identify risks, and recommend training requirements and corrective actions where necessary. A case study of this approach is the C-130 deployments to the Middle East in the early 2000s. The battle worthiness process identified the need to modify the wing fuel tanks with explosive suppressant foam and electronic warning and flare self-protection systems. In addition, the flight paths, altitudes and tactics to fly in and out of the high threat areas around Baghdad were certified by the Battle Worthiness Board. And uh, some of you might remember that uh, the RAF did not uh, put the suppression foam into their wings and they lost a C-130 with, regrettably, uh, the loss of everybody aboard uh, when the aircraft encountered ground fire near Baghdad, a round went into the wing and caused the, uh, uh, an explosion inside the wing or implosion and the wing eventually separated from the aircraft. The aircraft was lost and there was one former Royal Australian Air Force uh, navigator aboard that aircraft, Paul Padol. Uh, and secondly, I remember going into Baghdad in a C-130 and we were parked next to a US Air Force C-17 and there was a great uh, uh, deal of canvas and plastic covering uh, the inboard engine, the number two engine. Uh, the aircraft had come in shortly before us and had sustained uh, a missile hit uh, on the number two uh, engine. I understand uh, it, the way the missiles were fired defeated the uh, self-protection systems and uh, after that we had to modify all of our electronic warm, uh, warning self-protection systems. In the ADF today, all fl flying units deploying on operations need to be certified as operationally fit before departure. Leadership by example, a highly professional mission first safety always operational culture supported by robust and highly effective regulatory airworthiness, battle worthiness, risk management and safety management systems have delivered outstanding results for the Royal Australian Air Force. In conclusion, the journey from our early Australian Flying Corps days with total acceptance of high to extreme levels of risk to achieve the air power mission, um, those days are gone and gone forever. Today's mission first, safety always operational culture provides the most effective risk-managed way for the Royal Australian Air Force to deliver the Chief of Defence Forces and the Government's air power requirements. The outstanding result of 20 years of no fatalities in the air has been achieved by leadership by example at all levels of the Royal Australian Air Force in operational maintenance and logistic support areas. Our skilled Air Force people remain our most precious resource. Accordingly, leaders at all levels must continue to work tirelessly for the safety and welfare of all Air Force people. Mission first, safety always is an important part of that. Thank you very much.